Good afternoon. Today I'm going to read chapter 11 of The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger, published by Inner City Books. Chapter 11, Lamentation and Entombment. The Jung quote at the beginning of this chapter is, the God image in man was not destroyed by the fall, but was only damaged and corrupted, deformed, and can be restored through God's grace. The scope of the integration is suggested by the descent of Christ's soul to hell, its work of redemption embracing even the dead. The psychological equivalent of this is the integration of the collective unconscious, which forms an essential part of the individuation process. That's from Ion, Collected Works 9 2, paragraph 72. And this is the image of entombment as it was envisioned by the Hours of Catherine of Cleves. And this was about 1440, she did this illumination. Scripture says, And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, sitting over against the sepulchre, Matthew 27, 59 to 61. Although the Gospels are silent on the subject, in devotional art, the death of Christ on the cross is followed by Mary's lamentation, Pieta, over the dead body. This image of the Mater della Rosa has a number of parallels in mythology and ancient Near Eastern religion notably Isis lamentation for Osiris. A mother's love for her firstborn is perhaps the most powerful instinctual attachment of the human psyche. To lose the object of such intense possessive love challenges the very foundation of desirousness, the primordial psyche itself. The archetypal image of the great mother's lamentation for her dead son thus signifies natural libido deprived of its object. This corresponds to the necessary mortificatio phase of the alchemical process of transformation. Lamentation for the dead Christ has an additional implication for modern man. Mary represents humanity mourning its loss of the eternal images, wailing an elegy for the lost God. According to apocryphal accounts, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, Christ descended into hell and rescued ancient worthies, the so-called harrowing of hell. Quote, the Christian tenet that after his death Christ descended into hell has no very clear scriptural basis, but the concept appealed strongly to the early church and it first became an article of faith in the 4th century. The god or hero who descends to the lower regions to fetch the dead back to the upper world is well known in classical mythology and may have been the seed out of which the Christian idea grew. As early as the 2nd century, there existed a body of writing containing descriptions of Christ's descent how he overcame Satan and liberated the souls of the Old Testament saints. It was taught that because they lived and died in an era that was without benefit of the Christian sacraments, they were relegated to a lower place until such time as Christ should come to redeem them. The story is first told as a continuous narrative in the apocryphal Gospel of Nicodemus, perhaps 5th century where we read the gates of brass were broken in pieces and all the dead that were bound were loosed from their chains and the king of glory entered in. After Satan had been bound in irons, the savior blessed Adam upon his forehead with the sign of the cross. And so did he also unto all the patriarchs 
and prophets and martyrs and forefathers, and he took them and leaped out of hell. The early fathers of the church who speculated about the matter concluded that the precise region was not in hell itself, but on its border, or limbo. The subject enjoyed great popularity in medieval drama and literature. In Dante's Inferno, Canto IV, limbo forms the first circle of hell, and its inhabitants include the virtuous pagans, poets, philosophers, and heroes of classical antiquity. In medieval art, the subject formed one of the scenes in the cycle of Christ's passion. It continued to be represented through the Renaissance, but is seldom found after the 16th century. Unquote. This symbolic image, which has classical parallels in the myths of Odysseus, Orpheus, Alcestis, and Heracles, is of the greatest importance to depth psychology. It represents the ego's deliberate descent into the unconscious, the Nakia. The light of the ego is temporarily extinguished in the upper world and is carried into the lower world, where it rescues worthy contents of the unconscious and even conquers death itself. The latter is perhaps an allusion to the idea that the Nakia eternalizes the ego, that is, connects it with the infinite. There's a footnote. The decisive question for man is, is he related to something infinite or not? That's from Jung's Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page 325. The world of the dead represents the unconscious, especially the collective unconscious. Thus, during his confrontation with the collective unconscious, Jung had dreams and visions of visiting the dead and bringing them back to life. There's a footnote. See Jung's discussion of his seven sermons to the dead, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, pages 191 and following. And in paperback edition only, Appendix 5, pages 378 and following. See also the dream Jung reports on pages 172 and following. About these experiences, he says, quote, From that time on, the dead have become ever more distinct for me as the voices of the unanswered, unresolved, and unredeemed. These conversations with the dead formed a kind of prelude to what I had to communicate to the world about the unconscious. It was then that I ceased to belong to myself alone, ceased to have the right to do so. From then on, my life belonged to the generality, unquote. And that refers to Memories, Dreams, Reflections, page 191 and following. Belonging to the generality corresponds to being connected with the infinite. The ego is relativized. It acknowledges a superordinate authority and experiences itself subspecie eternitatis. Subspecie eternitatis translates as under the form of eternity. That's the end of chapter 11.